this lecture, we will discuss erythrocytes, also known as red blood cells. Erythrocytes, or red blood cells, or RBCs, however you want to term them, are biconcave discs, meaning that they dip in on both sides. So concave means to dip inwards. So we can see we're going to dip in, we're going to dip in on both sides. Mature red blood cells are anucleate, so as they grow up, they lose their nucleus. They also lack most other cell organelles that we are familiar with, which means if they become damaged, they do not have a way to fix themselves. Now, you have one billion oxygen binding hemoglobin proteins in your red blood cells. A billion with a B. We can carry a lot of oxygen on our red blood cells. And that's literally the job of red blood cells is to transport oxygen and a little bit of carbon dioxide. So since red blood cells don't have most of the organelles that we're familiar with, including mitochondria, they cannot do cellular respiration, but they still need energy. So instead they will do glycolysis which produces a little bit of ATP. Um, it also allows them to create ATP in an anaerobic way, meaning you're not gonna use oxygen. That way, all the oxygen that the red blood cells are carrying, they don't just use it all up to create their own ATP. So it's very convenient. Now we mentioned the billion hemoglobin molecules. Okay, so hemoglobin is a large protein. It has four different parts. We have two alpha and two beta chains, so our betas and our alphas, okay? and the shape is just a little bit different between an alpha and a beta chain. Okay? And then we will have one, two, three, four heme groups, okay? so each chain gets a heme group, okay? and the heme group is where the oxygens are going to bind to. So this idea of having multiple chains, multiple subunits, this is an example of quaternary protein structure that we've mentioned um, previously. Now each of these heme groups, um, it contains iron. Okay, so iron is required for proper formation of hemoglobins and so ultimately um, iron is required for proper oxygen transportation. Now, we have two options with regards to hemoglobin. We can have oxygen that's bound to hemoglobin, or we could have hemoglobin that doesn't have the oxygen bound to it. And we have to name these, of course. So when oxygen is bound to hemoglobin, we call it oxyhemoglobin. Mm. So HbO2. So oxyhemoglobin would be bright red. When the hemoglobin releases the oxygen into the tissues and the cells, which is what it's supposed to do. Once we dump off that oxygen, we form deoxyhemoglobin. Okay, so we have deoxygenated the hemoglobin. It's now a darker, more dull red color. So we can see our color differences, our bright red and our dull red. We either have oxygen or we have dumped off our oxygen. Now, oxygen is not the only thing that can bind to hemoglobin, okay, for better or for worse. Carbamina hemoglobin, which is really hard to say, um, is formed when hemoglobin binds to carbon dioxide instead, okay, so CO2, which we're also familiar with CO2. Like, we've heard of carbon dioxide. Okay. Now, this accounts for about 23% of the carbon that is transported through the blood. Okay. So that leaves quite a bit of additional carbon dioxide that we're going to have to transport in a different way and we'll eventually talk about that. But about 23% of the CO2 in your blood attaches to hemoglobin to form the carbamina hemoglobin. Okay. And it just binds in a different place. So oxygen binds to amino acids on the um, globin protein chains of the hemoglobin. Carbon dioxide just binds to a different place. Okay. 
Now, that one's not too bad, but carbon monoxide, so CO, can also bind to hemoglobin, which forms carboxy hemoglobin. Okay. The carbon monoxide binds more strongly to the iron on the hemoglobins than oxygen will. Okay. If carbon monoxide binds to the hemoglobin, it changes the shape of the hemoglobin and makes oxygen unable to bind or unable to load which means we could have plenty of oxygen in our bodies, but we can't get it out of our little red blood cells, which means we can't use it, which means our tissues become oxygen deprived. And if this happens long enough, this can kill you. Okay. So most people have heard of carbon monoxide poisoning. Okay. You probably have carbon monoxide detectors in your house. And this is why it's so vital that we detect this because carbon monoxide is, it has, it, there's no color, there's no smell to it. It's just there, you don't even know it. And it is basically robbing your tissues of oxygen. And again, ultimately it can kill you. Make sure you change the batteries in your detectors. Now, erythrocytes as a whole. We've got a few more characteristics. So normal red blood cell count okay, is between four and six million per cubic millimeter of blood. Okay, per cubic millimeter. That's a very, very tiny amount of blood. And yet you have four to six million red blood cells in that tiny, tiny bit of blood sample. It is mind-blowing how many red blood cells that you have in your entire bottle, in your entire body. Now, red blood cells, um, they do have a fairly short shelf life. 100 to 120 days is about the max. Okay. They do get damaged quite frequently because of the harsh environment in which they live. So don't forget that your blood flows through your veins and your vessels. It gets beat up. Um, we use them day in and day out. So it's a pretty rough life. And we did mention that um, mature red blood cells don't have the nucleus or most of their organelles, so they can't repair themselves if they get damaged. So once your red blood cells are damaged beyond repair, they get recycled in your spleen or your liver. We can recycle most of the components, so the iron and the heme, we can just go and create some new red blood cells. The heme itself can become part of bile with your digestive system. And the globin chains, the alpha and the beta chains can become new proteins. So we can just break those back down into um, the amino acids and we can create new proteins. Since your red blood cells don't live very long, we are continuously making new erythrocytes in your bone marrow. And we call that hematopoiesis. Okay. If we are specifically talking about red blood cells, we call it erythropoiesis. Hematopoiesis is the formation of all of your formed elements, so your red cells, your white cells, and your platelets. Okay. And everybody comes from the same origin point. You have hematopoietic stem cells, and they're called hemocytoblasts. Okay. These hemocytoblasts, they are stem cells. And if you know anything about stem cells, you know that stem cells can become many, many, many different types of cells. Okay. So these hemocytoblasts live in your red bone marrow. Okay. And we can send signals to your red marrow saying, okay, we need to create some new red blood cells. And we can start the process of erythropoiesis. So erythropoiesis takes anywhere between five and seven days from start to finish. That hemocytoblast, so here's our example, okay, can do what we call differentiation. So it, it can become different types of cells. So we have some funny names here, proerythroblast, myeloblast, lymphoblast, monoblast, megakaryoblast. And then we can further differentiate or become different cells if we keep on going. 
So we'll notice at the very left over here, we will turn in hemocytoblast. We will differentiate it into erythrocytes, red blood cells. Okay. Now, notice that the same cell, the hemocytoblast, that stem cell, will ultimately become your white blood cells, your leukocytes, and your thrombocytes, your platelets. Okay, so everybody traces back to this hemocytoblast stem cell. Okay. Now, why are we doing this? Who is telling us to do this? We have a hormone. It's called erythropoietin. It is secreted by your kidneys, and it is secreted due to low oxygen levels in the blood that gets filtered through your kidneys. So your kidneys notice that you don't have quite as much oxygen in your blood as you would like. And your kidneys think, oh, I know how to fix this. I'll just make some more red blood cells. We'll capture us some more oxygen. We'll get our O2 stats back up. So that erythropoietin, that EPO, triggers your red bone marrow to start differentiating, differentiating, it's hard to say, your hemocytoblasts are going to differentiate into your erythrocytes, your red blood cells. Okay. So here is the in-between steps. Boop, 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 boop. Okay. So we just mentioned the low oxygen levels are what trigger the kidneys to release the EPO. We just mentioned that uh, erythropoiesis can take anywhere between three to seven, five to seven days. Okay. Ironically, the number of red blood cells is not what controls hematopoiesis or erythropoiesis. It's how much oxygen that we have in our bodies. Okay. So it's kind of an interesting idea. If you lose a little bit of blood, but your oxygen levels are still normal, you aren't necessarily going to rush to replace all that blood that you lost. You will eventually replace it, but you might not be in a hurry. Okay. So we will start with that hemocytoblast. About halfway through, you end up with a reticulocyte, which is an immature red blood cell. Okay. And eventually, we will form a fully matured red blood cell. We do have some requirements for erythropoiesis, iron being one of them, which should make sense. We've already discussed heme and hemoglobin. But we've got two more, vitamin B12 and folic acid. Folic acid is a different type of B vitamin. Okay. Vitamin B12 and folic acid are required for mitosis or cell division, which coincidentally we are doing. Okay. So if you do not have adequate levels of B12 or folic acid, your erythropoiesis won't be quite as effective as you would like it to be. All right, that ends our discussion on erythrocytes.